How are your levels? Are they all right? Check, check, check. Yeah, that's my second sound check for today. I assume that you've got... Oh, we wouldn't want to make you hoarse. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> I'm more than used to it, unfortunately. <laughs> um, okay, sick. Uh, yeah, about a fist from your face, if you can, yep. most of the time. Um, I don't know how many podcasts you've done. Probably a few at this point. Done a, done a bunch. So, yeah, don't be afraid. I like this thing you're doing. I do this all the time. I've got ADHD, so I'm just like, uh-huh, yeah. Hmm, yeah, I don't know how out of shot I'm getting, Harry, when I do... Oh, sure. What if I do this? Am I out now? Like, <laughs> I can't see it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out when we edit in later. All right, well, yeah, thanks for coming, uh, thanks for coming up here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's We're nice in, to be um, in Froom. It's great. We're in the cheese and grain. Shout out to the cheese and grain. So thanks for letting us use your space. Um, Foo Fighters have played here. That's mad, isn't did it? Did you know that? I did know. Someone told me earlier on today, Andy. And um, yeah, it's just wild. This is a massive place. This oh. is like, that, like when is that full capacity? What is it, 800 people? Yeah, I think. That's massive, isn't it? Yeah. It's really cool to have a venue like that, you know, where you can put on such massive events. I don't think we've... In, in Southampton, where Creeper's from, and Salem, um, there's the guild... You've got the Joiners, which is obviously a classic uh, venue. That, that was, Coldplay played their first gigs. No effects, Green Day, everyone. Um, Kemp comes through. But that's only like a 250 cap room. Oh. And it jumps all the way up to 1,200 people. There's nothing in between. There's no middle ground. No, so something like this would be so good. And is this why you think like Southampton bands do quite well? Because there they is have no, no choice. There's no <laughs> choice. Just like, here's your first gig, here's the deep end. Um, it's weird. I think that we, we do have a, we did have that in the awards today. Like Buried Tomorrow, obviously, have done really, really well yeah. in there. And we had um, Not Advised kind of coming through back in the day as well. We had the, the delays, we had Banished Skulls, like a bunch of stuff. I don't know why it, it's so musical, but it, but it seems to be. Yeah, it, some places just kind of have it like in the water. Um, did you, do you remember a band called Kids Can't Fly? Yeah, of course. Robin yeah. was in the band. He used Robin. To be, used to be in a band called... Um, speaking of losers, when I was a kid, it was a ska punk band. Um, yeah, I know Robin. He was. I was studying music at Bath College, and he got a job as the one of the tech guys. So every time you wanted to book out a microphone or guitar lead or something, you'd have to go and see Robin. And so he joined Kids Can't Fly around that time, and it was just interesting to see a guy when you're studying on the staff that's like. Not that the staff were has-beens, but they were guys that had like been there and tried it and not really done it, or had like gone the other way and just gone pure theory. And and it was nice to see a guy like Robin, who's like, oh, do you want to see our new photo shoot? And you know, you kind of get this idea of like, oh, right, here's here's what we're being taught in action. You're following those principles of oh, you've you've all come to get you've all because he would drive miles from Bath to Southampton, and it'd be like. Oh yeah, we got this photographer for this reason. We've done this for this. And it was just interesting at that age just to see the products coming together. Yeah, absolutely. And that, it's a weird thing, isn't it, to watch like all, the amount that goes into even the smallest little part of a band is ridiculous. Yeah, and we we were talking when you were sound checking earlier. Good choice, by the way, of new rose. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, Harry noticed that. Um, all your purple leads. That actually is not us today. That oh. is that is that is the cheese and grain on their own. Is it? Um, but yeah, the typically, okay. typically what we do, like Creeper is very, uh, it's a very different band to this one. Mm. Um, so it's a lot, very theatrical. So we we have a lot of like keeping everything uh, kind of on brand and in synergy with each other. Like like keeping the show as well as the music. Like I think a lot of the time of our music, it's about the aesthetic matching the band, uh, which is a big thing. I think about my favorite bands. You think about the Misfits, like the, the you know, the Crimson Skull, like being so synonymous with the band, the branding being so important. Yeah. I toured with them, with Jerry Only's Misfits yeah. years ago. Yes. I, I feel like I need to like back you up here. Like Misfits changed my life. Like, oh, the, cool. I recently moved house and I was sat up in the van and, uh, and I had this Doc Martens shoebox on my lap and dad was like, we just filled the van up with shit boxes, everything. And he was like, 
why have you got that with what's in that and I opened it up and it was my Misfits coffin box set oh, I, was, <laughs> I was like this is precious cargo this is just like I and it was the first thing in the flat I got out the van with it I opened the door I, and I and it got in the flat and I found a spot for it and I was like I know it's safe it's not getting lost it's not getting crushed I'm not going to open it later in the, in the jewel case and yeah. the million pieces or oh, the, can you imagine all that fucking dope enamel badge missing or anything I'm like just like it's in there now and I'm like it's safe Exactly. I think people like you and I, though, like collectors and fanatics and things, I think that's like a lot of people who who are similar to us, that's the reason people find my bands for those same sort of reasons as well. Kind of like... There's a collectability Loving it, like like and being immersed in it. I think like bands like Ghost or something like that at the moment... They're really ticking that box. It's amazing, you know, like the the branding matching the music. is it's, It's so important these days, especially when it's harder to make money in the music industry than it's ever been, you know? Yeah. Um... So, More of a t-shirt company sometimes than a band. <laughs> so I was, I was just about to say, when we were talking about Robin, it was like, I was like, oh, so what have you done then? And he was like, oh, yeah, well, we supported the Misfits. And at that point, I was like, oh, my God, this guy's <laughs> fucking legit. And the last time, the, the only other time I've seen you is, um, or been in the same room of you, is you knowingly, is in Bristol when you toured with Jerry Only's Misfits. Yes, that was a while ago. That, I'm not, you don't have to make any comment on this, but I thought that was the worst show I'd seen them <laughs> Um, in, and not because they were playing like shit, just because the venue made it so fucking loud that it was, it was painful. Actually, it was horrible to listen to them because it was just so, so many frequencies just flying around that should have been scooped. I think it was it was weird that tour because like um, they had the drummer from Murphy's Law uh, on, on, on drums. I don't know whether it was him. He was a lovely dude, by the way, and it was Jerry. And Jerry's son, who's a really nice guy as well. Yeah. And he's like Jerry Jr. or something. They call him Jerry Other. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, like, but so it was like, it's one of the Misfits and uh, they're playing Misfits songs. And like, every day I was so stoked. I've got, at this point, I've got to tour some of my favorite bands in the world. We toured Tiger Army in America. Like, we've done like, all, like, all, like, a lot of the big boxes have been ticked. Um, but like, so every time I get to do something like that, I, I'm down the front singing along every day, just like you would be, you know, like in the same sort of thing. It's just, I'm a fan first, you know, and, and music, most musicians are just fans with guitars, you know, anyway. But at those shows, I couldn't tell what song it was for the first, they, they were playing so fast. They yeah. played like, and I, like me and Ian would be like, what song is this? Like, it's a dirge. Yeah, like, like I'm trying to, trying to pick the song out and then, then, you, then you realize what it is and you start to sing along. Yeah. But that was a, really, a real shame. But they, um, uh, they actually like uh, brought it back, brought me back from the edge. Uh, a few years later, we took, played a riot fest in Chicago the year they got back together with dancing. Oh my god! So we got to see that for the first time. And how was that? It was amazing. It was so good. I've seen Danzig uh, loads of times. Yeah. <clears throat> But um, and they would always do this bit where they bring Doyle out and he yes. and he stomp out and then play were you at with the him. Roundhouse. Yes, I was at the Roundhouse. Oh, shit. Yeah, well, I was at the Roundhouse and I was like, that, that was point, ages ago as well. Years ago, <laughs> and at that point, I was like. This is going to be the closest I ever get to a reunion, right? Because it was Doyle, Danzig, well, the, and the other guys in in Danzig. But it was like that was the closest I was I felt what we were ever going to get to hearing those songs from the horse's mouth, so to speak. That's what I thought as well. Uh, it's exactly the same same thing. And I was like, well, that, that was really cool. And I guess you know, I just wasn't born at a time where I was going to see the Misfits. Right, it's fine. But um, yeah, the Riot Fest thing. It was kind of everything you'd want it to be, mm. you know? Um, I was really, really elated by that. And, and it was, Danzig was a, a complete prick to a guy on, on, on the side of the stage, exactly as you want him to be, you right. know? Like, <laughs> you know, like the same people you like, I, I, I kind of want him to be an asshole. Right. Know? I got some friends that met Danzig when we were when we were touring in America. We had uh, like a real super Danzig fan in um, Dive Bomb playing with, um, he was depping on bass for Dive Bomb. Um, oh, I shouldn't say Depping. He was in the band. Sorry, um, <laughs> he was new, and um, and we, he was talking about. Oh yeah, we met Danzig backstage once. And it was really great, and it, <laughs> and he was like, and he gave us this bottle of water, and we were like, oh yeah, sick, right? And he was like. He told me they drank the bottle of water, right? And then he was like, and then two days later, we both had like the worst colds imaginable. And I'm like, that's so Danzig, I think. It's like, it's like he's come out of this venue like feeling like shit with a stinking cold. And he's got these two, these two dudes going like, oh, we love you, we love you. And he's just been like, I'm going to just give you my fucking cold, girl. Dude, it's weird as well as to give like kids a bottle of water. That's just strange. I can't imagine, yeah. I can't imagine doing that. Like imagine, going outside and giving someone my half drunk bottle of water. Yeah. Imagine you're, 
imagine your ego being in a place where, and I love, I like Danzig a lot. But you want him to have that ego. But though, there's, you know? I'm, I'm a bit fed up of rock stars not being naughty boys. It, it, yeah, I know. I, I've had the same well, thing. I need some edge. We've had this kind of, uh, I don't know, I think the, the, the death of the rock star has happened ages ago now, it feels like. And <clears> we've got the, um, everyone has to be basically YouTube personalities all the time. <laughs> and I, I hate it. I, I, find, I think it's really, um, it's the opposite of art, isn't it? You know, you're, you're a kid's TV presenter as well as a, uh, a singer in a punk band. And I don't know, I like the idea that Danzig's an arsehole, you know, like... Uh, yeah, I do. I like that. I, and I, in the same way as I like to think that, although Henry Rollins seems to have come on this this path of like self-improvement and redemption from the guy used to be, I still like to think there's probably some times when Henry Rollins can flick that switch and be a cunt. I think absolutely, it must be. Um, I, I, he's probably, it probably still happens now, you just don't see it as much. You know, He's probably more aware like, of what he does yeah. with his platform now. <laughs> yeah, with social media and stuff, the people are probably so aware that you can be... Um, like when Danzig got knocked out, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like... Northside kings are undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing that, that video of him getting sparked out and just thinking, oh... Oh no! Do you know the story oh, about oh, that? Do you mate. know how that happened? I think I know. It was the dr- wasn't he like the drummer of the opening act or something? Like, oh, so so basically, what happened? It goes down like this. Like apparently, so they were a support band, but Danzig didn't want to play that late. So he said, "You guys play after me." And uh, and they were like, oh, "Art's weird," but again, they were like, "We'll go way. home." Right. They were like, "Yeah," they, they was like, "Oh, but everyone's gonna leave." And he was like, "Well, it's not gonna happen if you don't do it, or whatever." From what I understand. Anyway, Danzig plays, and then the crew, the crew just pat the stage down. And they're, they're going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so that dude like like uh, confronts him. They were best band Northside Kings, and uh, yeah, that's what I heard. And then there's that incredible video. So when he gets knocked out, fuck you, motherfucker, and then punches him or whatever. And um, then uh, that, that dude from the from the like the crew behind him just turns around to the camera and goes, "Northside Kings are undefeated." You know, crosses his eyes. I love that so much. It's so funny. Yeah, it's so strange. It's so it's weird. And and so I never toured with Misfits, and I really wanted to at least do a, a support slot under that like banner or whatever. But we we did get quite close to opening up for uh, Doyle, and I was like, that would be sick. That's cool. And then we were offered a offered a tour with Michael Graves, and I was like, okay, this is all the little full because we did Dead Kennedys. And I was like, oh, little full circle moments are happening. We didn't do that in the end, and actually, I'm kind of pleased now because. Especially, I mean, it's already bubbling up, especially during the pandemic. Um, Michael Graves has, he's definitely gone to the dark side, hasn't he? He's, he's not he's, the naughty boy rock star that we want. Well, he's, he's a naughty boy, but in a really bad way. You know, he's yeah. like, like, you know, he's the enemy now. Like, yeah. I think, um, I don't know. Do you ever see that? Um, I think it was on like the Tonight Show where they had Bren from the Lawrence Arms on and they were interviewing Michael Graves and Bren was like, Telling, talking like this shit and it's being like he's you know talking about his politics and he was saying I just feel outcasted from being punk because you know I'm conservative or whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, conservative is the new punk yeah it's just stupid but Brent from the Lawrence Arms was just laughing at him it was really funny yeah it's that that depresses me because I still I, I still think I still think the Misfits era with Michael Graves it's super strong material it still like means a lot to me but it's like now when I listen to it I just can't help but like think about Michael Graves in like I think the thing is like Woodland like... Camo being <laughs> looking like he's on Duck Dynasty being a fucking racist a proud yeah, boy yeah that's exactly what he is isn't it unfortunately but the thing is I guess he didn't write any of those songs like so he's just a singer he was like a hired gun basically like, yeah. from what I, my understanding of like Famous Monsters and stuff so you can, I, I don't know I can still listen to that I, I don't listen to it all that much like really like the, the Graves stuff but like um I do like, like Famous Monsters is an amazing record. I think that's yeah. great. Uh, and, and, you know, Saturday Night is obviously the greatest horror doo-wop tune of all time. Right. right. And, and you're like one of the only people I know who, will, who has said that. Well, who I, can see that 50s doo-wop. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that, that's been a kind of a part of the Misfits. Like, even when Danzig was there a little bit, you know, especially like, like Danzig got really bluesy, didn't it? Like on Danzig 2. Like, um, oh, I'm the blood, one. Blood, blood and Tears. Blood, and, yeah. yeah, like, you know, Real, like that, all, all that, all that element of stuff, like different eras of music creeping in. Um, super I, cool. I had the best thing the other day. So, 
so I was talking to my girlfriend the other day and she's like into all the goth stuff and she's a bit older than me. She should bring her to the show. She's, well, she can't tonight, but she would <laughs> definitely be here. She it lo loves the downed, loves Depeche Mode, loves the cure, loves all this stuff. And I was like, you really listen to the Misfits? And she's like, no, not really. And I was like, oh my God, I'm get, I get to introduce you to the Misfits. And I sat there all, like almost all night just playing the misfits to her and she was really getting it and digging it and loving it and i was like oh this is the best thing ever and then we started playing danzig and she was getting that and loving that as well and it's very bluesy isn't it and it was just just like it's so nice to be able to introduce people still now to that music and it be like fresh to them and i was sat there going this is like a doo-wop thing and this is like a rockabilly thing and like and i was probably a bit too like probably a bit too much but uh, Bless her, she sat there and, and indulged me. No, absolutely. I think that the, the, the cool thing about, especially like the, 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 those early punk bands, you know, like The Damned, for example, like such a varied selection of records. There have been so many interesting places and records like Strawberries, starting off with like Damn, Damn, Damned and, and Machine Gun Etiquette. Even Machine Gun Etiquette goes in some crazy places, though, with their sound. Uh, I think a lot of that early punk rock was a lot more daring than what we have today yeah. uh, in, in lots of ways. I think now you get pop punk bands that play pop punk and you get hardcore bands that play hardcore. But a lot of that stuff, like those early punk bands, were a lot more interesting than that, it feels like. I feel yeah. like we kind of lost a little bit of that uh -huh. along the way for some reason. That's why when you're playing your girlfriend, those early Misfits records, it's still like immediate and urgent and, and, and uh, you know, vital. Um, yeah. Because it's like, they're timeless records. Um, I think so, like a lot more the, 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 the punk, like there are definitely exceptions, of course, but there's millions of punk bands now and yeah. a lot of them kind of stick their lane a little bit. But you listen to the Ramones or someone, there's so much, so much going on there, you know, so much, so much interesting stuff at that very really early, the early gate of, of punk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's wild, it's wild. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll probably move it back to the Misfits when I saw you guys. And, I, and I, it's weird that I get to ask you this now because I still remember it. As a, because when you guys came on, what year was this? 2015? 15, 15, maybe 16. 15. I don't know. They'd done, they'd done Famous, not, um, they'd done Devil's Reign at that point. Yes, that, I think that might have been the record they were in support of. I can't really remember. Uh, or that dead, that, that other... I hate those records of Jerry album. singing on his own, man. I can't do it. Yeah, that live album was disappointing. Devil's Reign is a great track. And then the, for me, the... I'm not into that. But anyway, back to you. So I saw you guys opening and I was like, okay, like this is obviously you're going to hear this a lot. Oh, this has got a lot of My Chemical Romance in this and stuff. And it, it was quite obvious that you guys were sort of, not in your infancy, because like, you'd obviously worked your way up to being on tour the Misfits. But then you were talking about, oh, we've got this new single that's just come out on Roadrunner. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Because I had no idea who you guys were before that. And then you, you jump, I don't know what that single was. What was that first thing you did with Roadrunner? Mm, at that point, it probably would have been uh, the, the, the Callous Heart, which is our second, our second EP. So it would have been, the first thing would have been Lie Awake or The Honeymoon Suite or something like that. Right. I can't and, really recall it. It was so long ago. Yeah, yeah. Blur. And, you, and you called it and you're like, yeah, yeah, we've been working on this with Roadrunner. This will be out soon, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you dived into that track. And the musician in me was like, ah. Oh, this is so much more sophisticated than, than the rest of the set. I could tell that you'd been really working really hard on that stuff properly with producers and things like that. Was, did you, would, would that be fair to say? Do you think that would be like a watershed moment when you were like, okay, we're wor working with people that like, or, do you, or did you get to like those more sophisticated arrangements and tightening up those like choruses and verses and things like that? Because like, it, was, it was, for me, head and shoulders above the other stuff. And from there... I only heard only heard that that level um, maintained and bettered basically. Well, yeah, I think the thing was so we made our first record. Those early records are all maybe the same person, but I think we were growing so much in what terms of what we could do. And around that period of time was when Hannah first joined on, on keyboard. Um, right. She so we made our first EP, which kind of got us uh, our early tours: Funeral for a Friend, uh, The Misfits, uh, Bayside, and bands like that. Are taking us away to open up for them, and um, which is amazing for me because you know, same as you, like the music fan in me is like, oh my god, this is so cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, like when I, I knew I wanted to make the second record where that had keys and um, like um, female vocals on it and some violin. So um, Sean knew a girl called Hannah who came by the studio, and I was like, I've always wanted to make more elaborate things, but. 
I was always a punk kid. I was a promoter before I was in a band and um, I was from that world, you know? And so I'm still don't really know what I'm doing that well. I just have loads of ideas. You know? Right. So meeting Hannah was somebody who was classically trained as the opposite of me, um, was a musical theatre kid, you know, from a completely different world to like the punk scene that you and I are from. Yeah. Um, but she always wanted to be involved in punk and I always wanted what she had. Yeah. So we kind of, she got involved and at that point, suddenly it was like opening this forbidden door and it was like, well... We can kind of traverse these two worlds now. And over time, Creepers just uh, started fusing more and more of that stuff in. And our last record, uh, we did a lot of doo-wop stuff. We did a lot of Roy Orbison um, sort of stuff as well in terms of like the Americana, the Bruce Springsteen stuff. And I did notice there was a lot of talk about America in that latest album, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah. Um, was that, is, that an, is that an attempt to kind of capture America a little bit more and kind of get a, a, a better footing over there or is it just like in keeping with, with the inspiration of that album oh no the, the record was a concept record so right. it, was, it was based on it. We, we'd spent so long touring America that um, I wanted like the, the first album was about was it another concept record uh, but it was based in the city we were from in Southampton and uh, in the time that had passed since that record came out we toured America like a lot we were always in America so it made sense for the second one to be based, uh, like the first one told the story of where we come from and the uh, second one to make uh, to talk about where we've been since. <clears throat> so we, so the concept was based out there. It was recorded in Hollywood. Uh, so it was all, like like America's very synonymous with this record. It runs like like um, railway tracks alongside each other. The, the concept and the reality are very close to each other. Interesting. That is interesting. I could tell as well... When I was listening to uh, your latest record earlier, with, with um, you have to remind me of a name singing. Of Hannah. Hannah. I could tell, because vocally she is approaching this from a, to a totally different style. Mm. And now that you've mentioned that she's got a musical theatre background, it's like, oh, just all that all makes sense because th there is, there's real training in there, isn't there? Yeah, it's funny because you've got me that's just like, you know, I'm a punk rock singer. And so like, I've never been trained. Uh, and like, I know how, like you were saying before we started, I don't want to wear your voice out. You're very unlikely to do that to me because I'm just such, so used to the same as you. Like, I've just been touring my whole life, like yeah. when I was younger, from, from a teenager. So um, I can just basically, a, a durability to it, but it's, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just, um, I'm just doing this, the thing I've taught myself to do that, and somehow, each day I warm up and it's fine, you know, but Hannah can sing like an angel every day. So I, I've always liked the contrast in our voices. We did a song on our, on our last full length um, called Four Years Ago, which is a riff on the Nick Cave and PJ Harvey song. Um, like, like there was a, on Murder Ballads, that first, uh, the, the Bad Seeds record. Um, there was the one with, there was uh, Henry Lee, which we covered for Made of Ale, BBC the other day, Daniel Picata. And um, there was Where the Wild Roses Grow, Oh. Which is uh, with Kylie Minogue. Um, and is so, that Kylie? Kylie Minogue on that, yeah. That, when I'm hanging out with my girlfriend, that's on, like, that comes on quite a bit. And, oh, that's and on fantastic. The I, I know that song. That's not Kylie. It's Kylie Minogue, yeah. Think so, so, about so, who that would have been. Because Nick's from Australia, so they, they, they had a hookup there. Again, the, the, and it was amazing to kind of, you know, um, take the biggest pop singer in, in Australia at the time and then put them with Nick Cave, who's right. going to sing a song about killing her. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyway, so I, I love that idea. And I was like, so I've been... Uh, trying to think of creative ways to use what we've got in, in, in Creeper. And so I was like fusing my weird voice and Hannah's beautiful voice together, like, like contrasting them. We did a duet um, in much, very much in the manner of those um, Nick Cave songs. And um, so getting to do that with like what was originally that punk band you saw years ago, which yeah. now we're, we're doing ballads and things. It's a different is, beast. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been really fun to toy with that. I think I'd get bored just doing the same thing right. over and over, you know. And so from that, that creeper success. At what point do you go? Okay, let's do Salem. Like where? Like so, what itch is Salem scratching? Well, when I was doing the, there was a, a considerable amount of trauma that happened in between the two creeper records. Our guitar player got very sick and and was he speaks he's spoken about it a lot now in the press. But he was uh, he was sectioned, um, and I, we had to hold him down and put him in the back of an ambulance, and he went away to the priory, and uh, so he was very very unwell for a very long period of time. But I was still asked to keep the record together. Um, right. So I was in Los Angeles on my own a lot of the time. So um, while I, I, we were trying to work out how to change the sound to get to where we are now, but I didn't have him there. So it was really, really difficult. We went through some really dark moments and I was in America an awful lot of that year on my own in Los Angeles. Um, 
Anyway, it was extremely stressful. And we wrote about 70 songs trying to work out how to write different types of music. Um, trying to, like, because you don't go from four chord punk songs to writing a Bruce, uh, like a Bruce Springsteen song or a Roy Orbison song. Um, and, and all the different arrangements that come with that. Overnight, you have to learn and try and like, trial and error and, and fail a bunch. Um, so that was really, really, really taxing on me. Um, I, 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 my best friend was very, very sick. And um, yeah, it was a lot going on. And uh, when I, I would come back from Los Angeles and I would go to, uh, to coffee with um, um, our uh, guitar tech, Matt, um, who plays in Salem. And um, he was just, I was talking to him about it. I was saying how stressed out I was and... It's difficult when the world's falling apart around you because yeah. uh, you just, you, you, I, I didn't know what I was doing was right. And, I, and it, was, it was a very, Creep is a very complex puzzle. Uh, a lot of these, these records are very um, nuanced and, and, and hidden with Easter, Easter eggs and, and, and references and, and pop culture nods. And so to, to, and, and it's because they were concept records, they all tell a story. That's a really hard thing to make a lot of the time. And when I didn't have my partner with me over there, like it was really difficult. So anyway, he said, if you ever wanted this come over, and just because I know him from house shows and, and 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 punk rock, like he was, he's a bunch older. He's six years older than me, and right. I used to go and see his old band Howard's Alias back in the day on Household Name Records when I was a little kid. And um, he said, "Do you want to come over and just like write some fast punk songs with me? Like I'm just gonna get that itch. We all know you get some wins in just for fun. You know? Yeah, come over and do that. Like that, I can demo them at my house, and we can just write that just so." You, you, you've created something that you're happy with because I was unhappy with everything I was making for Creeper at the time. Right. So I came over and uh, we wrote our first EP, what well, became our first EP, really quickly in like an hour almost. It was just like going through it because you got to understand like I, I've, been, I've grown up in, in you know, punk houses and things. And so I loved that. So that's all I know. And so writing that was really, really fun and it was a real outlet. We went to Neil Kennedy at the ranch, who's done Boston Manor, Milk Teeth, uh, like everyone, like he's, he's you know, uh, and did all the Creeper records, and he was in Southampton. Oh, we saw that. Yeah, we we did our last single in um, at oh, the ranch, you? and we we saw some um, Creeper stuff because, like, as you go up to where you where you sleep, they they've kind of lined the walls with oh, with records, like, sort of a more than life. I think there's maybe a is it possibly landscapes there. Yeah, landscapes with Neil um, as well. Yeah, puppy and. Um, and yeah, and you guys, uh, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's really neat. Narbles were there with Lewis in the other room as well. Like, just really, really cool place. But um, so I, we, like, Matt was like, "Let's record them for fun." And I was doing it like to let uh, pressure out uh, from what I was doing in Los Angeles. Oh, so it was a venting, yeah. Basically. But like, what really happened? Like, we recorded them, and it was really fun. I was, I live in Manchester now, so right. I'm, I'm not from Southampton at this point in my life. I've not been there for two and a half years. But uh, so I, I come down, and I, I, you know, I've only got a little while while I'm there, and I'm really busy with my other band as well. Um, so we, we recorded them, and they sat in like a Dropbox on my mobile phone, and for ages I just didn't think about it because um, Creeper got so busy again, and I was trying to finish off the record, and I started working that out. So at anyway, that point, had your your um, guitarist, what's his name? Um, oh, Ian. Ian, had he recovered and rejoined, or what? What's uh, well, this? He, like he, he was, he was still, uh, he, he never left the band, but he was, um, he was. Like it was really diff difficult. He, he was unable to fly. Uh, they wouldn't let him leave. Oh, uh, so he was still in America. No, no, he was in England. Oh, okay, but like, I was flying back and forth. Right. And each time he would. Like, he, uh, it's difficult. There's a big podcast that that was made about this by someone, a man called Charles Bidder. He was playing Great Cynics, if you remember them. Um, he was kind of like from that's the whole punk scene. Right. Uh, but he made a made a. If, if anyone listening to this wants to talk, uh, check that out, and it, 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 this, this story resonates with anybody, um, check that out. It's, it's on Mighty Moon Media, and you can get on Spotify and, and, and stuff like that. But Ian spoke at depth about what happened. He basically believed in a massive conspiracy and uh, had severe mental health issues. But right. so he would talk to me like normal on the phone. He yeah. like he'd call me up and speak to me like you are now, yeah. and we talk about songs and things. And then at the end, he would go into this conspiracy thing and and and. Uh, he believed it, and uh, yeah. So even though he thought he was okay to, to fly, like his wife and the doctors and, and and people that knew better than me were saying he wasn't. And then there was a, I, also we were on a record label, so yeah. uh, like Roadrunner over here is run by Warner UK, and so there was a lot of uh, money and pressure and things involved. So I had to finish this thing, and and right. but Ian eventually came back, um, but he never went. He hasn't been back to America since his accident, and. Right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if you ever truly recover from properly. You'd be in recovery your whole life from that. I'm yeah. not sure how it works. I'm not an expert on it, but um, but yeah, like the Salem thing. Basically, 
was a um, was a kind of therapy for me a little bit at the yeah. time. And I'd fallen in love with somebody from Manchester and I'd written all these love songs about this girl and uh, this fast punk songs. I, I kind of saw it like the Bouncing Souls of a band like that, you know? Right. Um, but like we're Alkaline Trio, like Bad Religion. We're talking about that that era, that kind of style of punk rock. Um, and it's stuff that's really fun. And, and, and it's not, like Creeper's very serious, um, even though it's the, there's, there's tongue-in-cheek jokes to it. And Salem's kind of all fun, you know, like it's yeah. all it's all silly and and um, and and fast punk rock. So yeah, I, I didn't um, we didn't touch it for ages. When the um, when the pandemic hit, uh, Creeper was about to put out that record, and the world shut down, right? Which is a complete nightmare. Um, so we couldn't tour. We had we were supposed to be abroad, like basically constantly. I, I probably would still be on that campaign in another country right now, right? Um, so yeah, I was supposed to be in Australia and all this sort of stuff all got pulled at the last minute. So I had to work out, we were all working out, and I'm sure everyone here as well, uh, what, how we carry on doing our jobs in the middle of a recession. Right. Not recession, sorry, <laughs> a, a, a pandemic. Pandemic. Um, a recession but, coming. A recession coming, yeah, yeah. absolutely, the, the prelude. Um, but also there was a lack of support for the arts at, at that point as well, and, and uh, we were all... Uh, self-employed musicians were like, like, and, and local venues, and, and uh, it was all really treacherous and difficult for us to walk and navigate. And um, while I was doing the Creeper record, I was like, "Oh shit! Like, I've got this Salem stuff um, that was it, like, like in, in uh, on my in this Dropbox." And I was like, "Oh, maybe I should revisit that because I've got all this time on my hands now, and um, it would support me, and also like the kids that like our band." Um, I just sat at home doing nothing. Like, right. I, tried, like I went from, we took a year off in between records for Creeper and then I put out a Creeper record, a Creeper EP and two um, Sailor Matt EPs really, really quickly in a, in a row. But this, I just basically adjusted what I was doing like, like with my business but also with like my creativity and, and how I, because normally you make a record, you tour it for two years and you come back and do another one. It's a cycle yeah. to this. There's a, there's a blueprint for how this works but we couldn't do that anymore suddenly. Um, but yeah, I, I sent it to Roadrunner and I was like, I want to put this out. My contract negated that I had to take it to them first. And they right. were like, okay. Well, any side projects or... If I, sing, if I sing on someone else's record, I have to. Well, I, had, I had to ask them all the time. Okay, and a bit of a tough question maybe to, to put you on the spot here. Are you happy about that? Are you down with that? Or is the payoff of being, you know, having a band on a label like that, you know, you think that's worth it? I think um, it, like, uh, is it, there, there's... But I guess they want to know because they want to support it. Yeah, or, or like, the you know, the day. and also I think they probably want to know, like, I had like an exclusive artist contract or something. I can't remember the, the wording of it. Right. But it basically meant that, like, um, it was annoying sometimes because, like, a friend's hardcore band would be like, do you want to come and, like... Scream like, on this or, chorus. Or come shout on this fucking thing or, yeah. or sing on this thing. And I'd be like, I've got to ask my label. And they'd be like, oh, you've got to ask your label, you know? <laughs> and they'll be like, yeah. And I'd be like, that, it's so embarrassing because yeah. these are people that I've known forever from yeah. the punk. And you think that that they're going to think that you're like... Yeah, throwing, being snobby or like, yeah. being like, well, I'm on a record label. Being a twat, but it wasn't yeah. like that. Like, But it was, it, so it's, it's good and bad. Um, it, it was it was frustrating at some points. But like this, if in this instance, it was great because um, Ray Vanna heard, heard the record and knew that we were all going to struggle for money because touring and revenue kept from that disappeared for us. And right. we weren't being supported in the way we should have been from the government. And um, we ended up, uh, we ended up, they ended up taking on the uh, the EPs, the two EPs and giving me an advance for them and letting me, it wasn't a lot of a, like a, a, like a, a small budget to make a video, but it reminded me because Salem is, reminds me so much of Creeper when it first started in terms of, not in terms of how it sounds necessarily or how it looks because this is, bubblegum pink, you know, and it's different, yeah. a different vibe. But in terms of, they go, oh, you've got 500 pounds to make a music video. Go and try and do that. And I was like, you know, and you had to go, oh shit, like how am I going to do that? Right. Because like, I'm used to, Creepers got to a size now where we have a budget for things. Um, so yeah, it's, it, that's kind of how it all came about. It's a very long story I've told you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, what, so you're here today with Salem. So what what is what's the creeper plans right now? What, what? Well, we, we go on tour in December. Um, so we're on, actually on tour in December. Uh, I think it's basically the, the, like like everywhere's sold out apart from this. I think there's like forty tickets left in Leeds now. But the lineup for that thing is crazy. It's um, we booked it ages ago, yeah. and it kept getting pushed back as these things have been for us. Um, but it's Static Dress opening up. I don't know if you've heard of them, those guys. Really, really great band. Was uh, it Static Dress? Mm. 
really cool, like old okay. school kind of emo stuff. But like, oh, okay. Like, like it's it's really cool. Like it sounds like Under Oath or something like that. Yeah, right. It's really really cool. Um, then you've got Wargasm, um, yeah. who are um, obviously world beaters right now. Holding Absence on the tour as well. Nice. And then it's us. We're doing, um, in London, we're doing um, the Kentish Town Forum, um, which is the biggest headline show we'll have done on our own yet. Uh, so, like, it's, it's really exciting. A very different thing to this, where it's like, this is just, a, a, you know, um, a, a really crazy punk show. And yeah. some of these shows have been mad because a lot of these kids that are coming to these ones, these, these gigs, haven't ever seen me in a small room like this because they've only known me Wooden Creeper got a little bigger. Yeah. Um, so some of them, these shows, some of them have been absolutely crazy. Um, some of them have been like absolutely fine, but like, you know, some, but some of them have been wild occasions. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's very different. And in, in, uh, in December, we're doing a very elaborate production for Creeper and it's, um, it's really exciting, man. Uh, well, I, uh, elaborate. Mm. Can you can you elaborate on your elaborate? Well, you know it, it, it's difficult because I, I, like Creeper is Creeper operates in a different way to Salem. Salem's like you know uh, it is what it is and it's fun and it's it's out there. But Creeper kind of uh, works under a shroud of secrecy and a, a lot of what we do is, is about mystique and um, misdirection and. Uh, you know, kind of magic, I suppose, in a, in a lot of ways, for want of a better word. Uh, so I wouldn't want to ruin what we're going to do necessarily, but there's, um, we're trying to tell a story with the show this year. Um, we, we did one, did a tour before called The Fear to Fear, which is the, the big tour on our last record. And that was, cost us a fortune. We had this, we had this massive mask that was, eight, it cost 8,000 pounds, this mask. Right. It was made of steel. And <laughs> it was like two stories big. Yeah. And it had a kabuki. Do you know what kabuki is? I've heard, oh, I've heard the word kabuki in a, like a no effects song, but I don't know what it means. Well, it's it's uh, it's like a big sheet that drops. You've seen them at gigs before, you know, like like a, a big like. Um, still not have one. I've the seen fun, like Motley Crue, yeah, and it yeah. Comes, that is so sick, though. It's isn't cool. It? We had we had it at the back of the stage behind it. I said people didn't know the mask was there, and it had like lasers out of its eyes and all this shit. So <laughs> like it, it was a nightmare to do every day. Uh, it cost a fortune for these shows, but um, I wanted it to be something that when you come and see that band. You escape for that period of time. Right. Like that that's creepers about escapism. Mm. And when people come and find us, it's often like people who are very similar to me, queer kids, and um, maybe like trans kids, people who uh, are uh, having a hard home life, um, like people who are lost in the world, kind of yeah. find our music and find a home in this stuff because it is so theatrical, and they know that we're the same. You know. Um, yeah. So when I'm really protective of that of that community and that world. Um, so yeah, these shows. Or elaborate, elaborate theatre pieces because I want it to be when we come for your town, you never know what you're going to see. So right. telling you what we're going to do would, would ruin, would ruin, <laughs> would ruin it. it. <laughs> okay, so you could probably tell me, I mean, we've all, well, I hope we've all seen Spinal Tap when they're talking about their, uh, <laughs> um, their, uh, their production on the road and all the things that could go wrong. What were the things that didn't, what were the things where your label went, that's fucking stupid, we're not giving you that much well, the, 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 lab, the label, you know, the, the good thing about or, it is the label... Or do they don't... just go blank check it? Because that doesn't really happen anymore, but are they like... It doesn't happen like that at all, actually. Like, the, 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 they like, the label have nothing to do with it. Like, uh, because there's these two sides to the music industry where it's like, one's in the office for the, for the record and the other is the kind of touring crew. And it's right. really rare, like our, like, our tour manager will interact with the label at all because right. he's the captain of one ship and they're the captain of another, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, we have had tour support from them before. We probably spent it in a stupid way. I don't know what we've done. But like, I, I, I'm really particular about it and I, and I try to keep it um, my way as much as I can. Dude, when you said that a minute ago, I've got to tell you the story that happened right. the other night. Uh, where are we playing? We were playing in Nottingham the other night, right? With, with Salem. Mm. And my girlfriend came to the show. And so I missed soundcheck and went to, uh, to dinner with her. <clears throat> and I left our tour manager for Salem uh, to set everything up. And um, I was like, dude, just make sure the mic's loud enough because if, if it, like, uh, I haven't got any ear, in ears on this because it's a really small tour, you know, yeah. playing, like, places I never normally do. Uh, so we, we, we can't afford to bring, like, the sort of stuff I'd bring out with, with uh, Creeper. So I was like, just make sure it's loud enough in the monitor. When we're playing the gig, if it's not loud, I'll, I'll just signal to the, the sound guy or make it louder, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, make sure you take the mic up, though. Because every day I'll, I'll do some sort of mic trick, whatever. And, and I was like, just, he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, go to the dinner. We come back. Um, the kids are already in the venue, and I'm upstairs, and I'm like, Ryan, did you, 
they did make sure the, the, the mic was taped. And he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the sound guy's going to do it for you. And I was like, Uh-oh. all right, okay. <laughs> like, didn't really think much of it. Yeah. Anyway, so um, we're doing this show. The intro comes on and I, like, I walk out. I don't even look at the mic because I just pick the mic up and, and start singing or whatever. We're doing the show. So been doing a couple of mic tricks and stuff, like just, just, just doing my show. Um, the kids are dancing. It's all going great. Anyway, I got to the second song and I'm spinning it and I feel suddenly feel the, the tension on the lead like snap. <laughs> and I'm like, and I just watch it, dude, Andy, man, like, like, I'm just spinning it and I just watch it. And, and as it's coming out of my hand, it goes up. It's lovely, lovely it's on the up stroke. Right. But it just detaches the mic and it, it's my mic as well. So I bring my own stuff with me because of right. COVID and everything as yeah. well. And it's like a heavy boy, this mic. And I just watch it disappear. <laughs> This has never happened to me before because normally there's so many people involved with Creeper stuff as well. Like people know how I like things and I was like, oh my God. Because <laughs> if that had detached, it's a little bit lower, right. I'd probably be in court soon right. for it because it would have hurt. Yeah. You know? And I never want to hurt anybody. That's not me. Uh, but just assume they'd only put a little tiny bit of tape on the bottom. Uh, normally you put the lead around and wrap it. Yeah. And, but I didn't know where they'd done that. Anyway, it went up and just flew up into the balcony, like on this thing. So I was like, thank fucking God. Oh my God, that's so good. And, and, but then I'm like, so the kids have seen it, and everyone, but no one's faced. Everyone's just carrying on dancing. People are, are, are moshing and stuff. And I'm like, cool, I guess. And so I go over, I get the other mic from the other thing. I can see our tour manager, Ryan, just like in the doorway like this. I can see his arm like, <laughs> staring at me. And I'm like, I'm like, like looking oh, at him. I fucked this yeah, up. He, like, 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 and he disappears. <laughs> he, he disappears. Like, like, like in The Wedding Singer, where he's like, and I'm reaping all the benefits. And then, like, kind of goes like, he just disappears like that. And I'm like, right. where's he gone or whatever? Anyway, so I've got Matt's mic. I'm singing with that. And um, anyway, Ryan goes and finds like an SM58 at the back. like, And he's, bless him, because um, he realizes, even though he didn't tape it, he realizes he probably should have taken care of that. Right. And I'm like, fuck, I've almost killed somebody today. Like this, this stupid mic trick. Anyway, he, like, I didn't see him coming on. So after that stupidity, what just happened, I'm singing with this other mic, do it, carry on in the show. He comes on, like bounding on the stage to try. You met Ryan outside, you yeah. know, like, you know, he's not, not a small dude, you know, like, and he comes on and he's bounding on. I don't see him. I step backwards. Like, this is this, it, it, all within like the same minute, oh, okay? Mate. Or backwards, he trips. Oh. He trips over my foot in front of all these kids. <laughs> and he just like, bang, like on, on the floor. I turn around, I'm like, honestly, it's the craziest, some of the craziest, like, minute I've had on stage. I look down, I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Like, Ryan, what? What why is this happening? Here? Ryan, why are you on the floor? Like, like, and Ryan's just laying there and bless him, he just gets up, brushes himself off and he just creeps back behind the door and he's out the door again. I'm like, God, and, he's, and he fixed it. Anyway, the next day I get to the venue and the mic is taped. I'm talking like, he's taped it all along. <laughs> like, it's like this long. I got like an ice cream cone right. fucking thing. Anyway, yeah, that was the other day on this tour. Right, madness. That's funny. Uh, James from the Cold Gun, who we've just had in, he was telling me earlier that you've recently befriended Dave Vanian. Is that right? Are you guys tight? What's going well, on there? It, I, I, mean, I want him on my pod. It's basically what I'm asking. because I, 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 <laughs> um, So the thing is, I, I'm not as, like, I've met Dave a bunch of times, uh, but I'm, I'm friends with Patricia uh, from Sisters of Mercy, who is a uh, Patricia Vanian. Um, right. So she was in the Gun Club, Sisters of Mercy, back on the Floodland record. Uh, she was in the bags. Um, so, this story starts, I was at the Kerrang Awards and um, we were uh, going in. I've been to see the Damned like, since I was a kid, like, like one of my favorite bands and my girlfriends as well. Um, anyway, like, you know that, how those things work? Like you're outside and there's like all these kids out there and you're signing things and, and it's all like, well, you know, like this kind of showy bit outside and you get through the door and then there's just like a queue. So everyone's like cattled in. So like it'll, outside it looks like you're the, you know, this massive band. As soon as you get in, you're just like literally in a line where you have your photograph <laughs> taken against some wall. So it's funny. And that, that is a really... What I've just described to you. Networking opportunity, right? I, I, I just hate network, networking. I don't do it. Surely just, you're I, rubbing shoulders to someone and you're like, well, oh, yeah. I know what about, hello. Well, well we, 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 like, I met that day, I met Alice Cooper. I met uh, <laughs> Tony, I, I, like, me and James uh, from uh, Death of Anna took a piss next to Tony Iommi. <laughs> and uh, it was just crazy. It was a really weird day. But anyway, right. the coolest bit for me was, I like those people, like, Black Sabbath, one of my favorite bands of all time. Yeah. Um, and the Alice Cooper story is also funny. But... The, uh, we could be coming in, right? And I see Dave uh, from behind me and I, and I turn around to Ian. I'm like, Ian, man, that's fucking Dave Vanian there. And I was like, I can't. I've never had the opportunity to speak to him before. Right. I really, really have to go and say hello. I was like, I know we're supposed to be in this queue and it's boring and long. We don't want to lose our spot because we just, everyone wants to get to the free bar that's inside. <laughs> so I'm like, I, 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 we're hanging back, man. And he's like, he was like, okay, okay, okay. So we hang back. Anyway, as he comes through and he's, he's always dressed amazing, Dave. And he come, came, came through 
And I walked up to him and I was just like, just absolutely starstruck. I was, right. I was like, oh man, like, it's so nice to meet you, Dave. I'm a massive fan. I've been to see you since I was really young. Like, um, lo- I love everything you do. I was talking, talking at him and, and he was like, oh, he's lovely. He's the most polite man you can ever meet. Such, such a gentleman. Right. He was like, oh, he's like, oh uh, nice, nice to meet you as well. He goes, um, what band are you playing then? And I said, oh, I'm playing this band called Creeper, Dave. And he goes, oh, I know, I've heard of Creeper because I think my daughter likes you. And so <laughs> their daughter, Emily, like who, who um, plays with his hand, does violin and stuff on, on their show sometimes. Um, and is it is it like like a, a cool Mosha kid? She's awesome. She's really really cool. And um, she was like, uh, she was oh Patricia's uh, like, uh, like meet Will. And then Patricia turned around, and I was like, they're both here. I was like Patricia Patricia Morrison. It was a, a you know a, a original name, a stage name, when she was younger. And Dave Aney is standing in front of me, like two of my like eighties and seventies heroes, right. you know, like, like icons of goth. You know, yeah. like I was like Jesus Christ, this is insane. So I'm like. Oh hi, nice to meet you. She's, oh yeah, we, like Patricia was like, oh yeah, taking Emily to see you at the festivals and things, blah blah blah. And I was just like, I suddenly I, I was aware I am talking too much, like kind of like now. And uh, like I was like, oh, I'm talking too much. I was like, I'm just, I'm just gonna let you have a good good night. I'm lovely love to meet you. If you ever want to come to any creeper stuff, let me know and I'll put you all on. So that's how we first met. Then um, they creeper uh, uh, Patricia. But this is what first happened. Creeper came back. Creeper took a year's hiatus and we didn't have social media for a year um, and did a blackout for an entire year. And while I was doing that, um, we were doing the record in Los Angeles, all the stuff of Ian happened, all in the shadows. It wasn't on social media. I didn't even have social media that year. We came back with a gig in London and I invited Dave and Patricia. And Dave and Patricia came to the gig, which Ooh. was like a big one for me. Right. And uh, after the show, I was covered in my makeup backstage and they came through... Uh, they came through the, the, the doors and come to say hello. And um, hang out with Dave there. They invited us to a damn show at the Palladium. And we, we went to that. Patricia got us like the amazing seats. They were supported by the Circus of Horrors. And it was just, the, you would have loved it, man. You would have absolutely loved it. It was so sick. And we went to their after party. They got invited to an after party. We were all dressed as vampires because it was the Night of a Thousand Vampires thing. And there was a guy playing Aladdin Sane, the David Bowie record, one of my favorites as well. On piano as we came in, they gave us a glass of wine. We came in. David... This show, I don't know if you've heard about this damn show. Um, in the interval, Dave shaved all his hair off and had uh, himself done up as Nosferatu and came back on. But he, had, he also attended he attended the after party in all his Nosferatu makeup. And let me show you this picture. There's a, 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 I can send this to you as well if you want to put it somewhere so people can see at home. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, like they, they, um, they, uh, Dave was in all his full Nosferatu makeup um, and... Uh, it's the coolest thing ever. He, he, he was so nice to us then. And now I asked Patricia to do some spoken word on the Creeper record. So she did that. And uh, we went to dinner and uh, she's coming to the show in London, actually. And okay. we're doing that damn cover in London. Right. And I was like, do I tell her before that we're going to do a husband's song at the, at the show or do I let it be a surprise? I think Emily's coming as well. Is it weird? Do we not do it? Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a great, there's a great picture I, I've got to show you um, of, uh, of me, Dave and Charlotte, uh, my girlfriend. So check this out, right? right? So like Charlotte's dad, my girlfriend's dad, oh, while well, I get this picture up for you. Yeah. Um, Charlotte's dad used to, uh, like, still does, plays in a band called Dare who are really cool. They're like um, a punk band. Um, this is why I went late. I'm not on the internet. Um, uh, from <laughs> years and years ago, like, like back in, they started off like back in the 80s. And um, in the band was the, the, the singer, is the keyboard player from Finn Lizzy. And uh, oh. P- Professor Brian Cox played right. a piano. So it's, Professor, it's, it's, it's all insane, isn't it? It's all absolutely right. wild. Um, but he's like the coolest guy in the world. You know when you meet your girlfriend's dad sometimes and you're younger and it's kind of awkward, you're like, oh God, like, is, uh, is it, are we going to get on or whatever? Yeah. Um, he, he is. So right. this is us at um, <clears throat> the, the after party. Um, <laughs> so Dave is still dressed as Nosferatu. Has he got sh- shades on? Uh, yeah, he, he, like, so, so after the gig, he put his, sh- his glasses on and yeah. uh, that's just how he was. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's me and my girlfriend. It was at the art party and I was absolutely hammered at that thing as well. Um, but he took his picture with Dave when he was dressed as Nosferatu still and from his stage. And that's great because I bet like you, you, d- you could actually talk to him and you didn't have a bunch of people trying to like hang around and take his time because they didn't uh, know he, he was Dave Vanian. Yeah, well... Uh, well, maybe uh, they did because it's the after party. He's just been so nice to us and he's been such a supporter of the band and um, I think uh, when, when I say like we're influenced by the damned I think you can hear it in our songs I, can, I think you can hear it in the way we dress for this tour we've been using uh, the, the Church of Salem is like the, the nuns and everything we've been using for the, for the imagery yeah. it's based upon um, the, the, the campaign that the damned did for the record the Strawberries record um, ah. 
Anyway, I was, I was telling you about Charlotte's dad. Um, so Charlotte's dad, right? Yeah. He's this fucking awesome dude. I love hanging out with him. I would hang out with him if he wasn't my girlfriend's dad. He's just, I, he's just a, a, a awesome dude. So he plays in that band there, and they, uh, he'd been taking Charlotte to see The Damned, like, since uh, she was a little girl. Right. So when we met, I was like, oh my God, we love, we love this band. And so, uh, yeah, like, I, I talked to him about this stuff all the time with The Damned and everything. He... Um, he went to see them loads back in the 80s and stuff and had like loads of posters from the shows like that he, he, he kept in the attic. Oh. And, and we did this Salem video that was like um, supposed to be like a Hacienda era Manchester, you know, oh. when it was all like that old punk stuff. And he, he gave us those little posters and we, and we did them up and we, we, we like, took them on Photoshop and fixed them. They all crumpled and ripped right. and like uh, made brand new versions of them and put them up on the walls. And so it was all like period kind of this is England style stuff. Oh man. It's neat, isn't it? It's that cool. is attention to detail. Yeah, man. Like it, it was just a, a video for this song, Draculads. And um, it was when the record company wouldn't give us any money for the video. They wouldn't let us film inside because of COVID. And so we had to only could do out, outdoors. So um, I was like, well, I live in Manchester where like I, I lived in Salford at the time where, um, you know, Ian Curtis and Joy Division and everything was started. Yeah. I was like, let's, let's use all this to our advantage. Let's do a period piece. So Ollie from that band Static Dress I was telling you about is also this amazing videographer. Right. And we went around and filmed it all on the budget. But, um, we, we didn't have any permits for anything. So we're getting chased by security guards in car parks and all sorts. <laughs> and that wasn't that long ago, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's still punk rock. Um, Salford, have you, have you spent any time with Don, John Cooper Clark? No, I wish I had. <laughs> I, I spent some time. Have with you? Him. He. What is he like? He's wild, man. He's great. We um. He did. He, he came here, and I didn't. That's so cool. I didn't interview him on the phone prior, and then I came to the show, and then uh, he had the Clash's old manager with him. His name was like Johnny Green, I think it was, and he was like. In That's not nice, cowboy man. boots and had like a shirt on with the little, what are those little tassels? Yeah, like a, bale a, 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 bello, a bolero tie, is that what they're yeah, called? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah you know what I mean. And and he had like the thickest, like, you know, he has those Wayfarer glasses yeah. with the red lens and they were like the thickest, like, because they were clearly prescription as well, not just like rock star shit. I love it. And and he had these like um, leopard print, like uh, teddy boy boot things on, like up to his ankles. And I remember Johnny Green like helping him across the car park because he couldn't see anything because it was dark, but he wouldn't take the fucking glasses off because he really wouldn't be able to see anything anyway. So it's so odd watching him like he, someone helping him across because if he takes them off, he's fucked. And he keeps them on, they're dark and he's <laughs> fucked, right? <laughs> so he's just getting helped across. And we went into, uh, I probably won't say the name of the place, but we went into one of the like, local hotels and uh, went up into one of their posher rooms and he was drinking mojitos and uh, <laughs> I having, love that. having a fucking spliff out the window and, uh, and the staff had to come up and ask him to not, not smoke fucking weed in their, in their like posh room and stuff. And we were just... just I managed, What's he like, man? He's amazing. I managed to grab like five minutes with him where there wasn't other people trying to grab five minutes with him. You know what it's like. And I was like, oh, so tell me about like, you know, the, the original punk days. And he was like, wow, I went on tour with Johnny Thunders and it was great. And it's like, and they were both on heroin at the time. And he was like, and um, he was like, and we had to, I had to leave him at the Canadian border. And he was like, so I gave, had to give him all my methadone because I couldn't fly with it. And he was like, and that was the last time I ever saw him alive. <laughs> I was just like, this is what? That is so this insane, is just, isn't just it? crazy stories of like those original icons like he was just there, like floating around them all and like doing drugs to them and stuff. That's so cool. I mean, like, like that that era of, of music is like you know so influential to me. Like Johnny Funders and stuff as well. You know, especially the fashion and stuff back then. Mm -hmm. You know, Patricia yeah. was telling me like uh, like she, she you know she, she, she's really really cool. She tells me about all the stuff back in like you know California back then as well. And she'd be talking about like they wouldn't get dressed up or like with, with, like, like like that until they got to the place. It was so dangerous to walk around oh, shit. dressed like that. Well, if you heard that um, Social Distortion album live at the Roxy, yeah, of course. You yeah. know when he's just about to do Prison Bound, and he's talking about like how it used to be dangerous to be a punk rocker, and he said, and if you walked around with your pink hair, you get battered. Yeah, yeah you're likely to get into a, a fight with five construction workers or cops. <laughs> and he was talking about how it's like, but when punk rock used to be dangerous, and he's like, you couldn't go to the mall and get your your hair dyed and get your pussy pierced, and it was just like, yeah, man, like you, like he's talking about a time when it was 
actually dangerous to be who you were. Dude, I did this thing with Gary Newman the other day. Uh, what, this, what, this, this, what, is, this is crazy. Yeah, no, we're, ju we're jumping all over the place now. Jesus about Christ. It. Yeah, it was really cool. It was, it, it, again, I feel like I'm just talking about loads of other people. I know we're here to talk about other stuff, but just because you, you brought that up. Yeah, um, no, I want to hear your Gary Newman story. Well, that's, that's it, cool. it, was, it was really funny. Um, so like, I keep mentioning this. this. This one I've been bringing up so much recently because it was such a head, it's Gary it was Newman. Such a head fuck for me. I was like, oh my God. So like, I got asked to do an, uh, a piece with Gary Newman and um, it's really cool. It was for Discover magazine. I, I don't know if I can show you a picture of the cover they did for it. It was on my Instagram. Um, oh, but, shout out Discovered. Yeah, shout out Discovered magazine. Um, and it was really, really cool. I've um, been listening to Gary Newman recently as well. That's what what have you listened to? He's like new stuff. It's that, amazing. That new one's really, really good. Yeah, my girlfriend's been putting it on and it's great. And there's one where he's got his daughter singing on it. Is that right? Oh, One of the songs she's singing. In I, I haven't heard. I didn't 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 know it was, it was his daughter. Oh, this well, this is this is the picture they did with us too. It was, they based it on the film no. Face Off. <laughs> no way. Yeah. That's uh, so cool. And like the the, the 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 notes we've got for it because we want it to be like the movie Face Off. Yeah. And then I was like, that's funny. But um, yeah, they, they, so it was like a Zoom call with Gary Newman, and I was like, I do a lot of those Zoom calls because that's the way this industry is these days. Yeah. And it set it up, and I was like, oh. This is, I was minutes before, I'm just like, this is weird. I was like, oh, he's listening to Gary, like, you know, listen to To Bay Army and like all that stuff, like loads going up. And like, it always be on around the house. And also, like, music your dad, your parents give to you, but it's, it's actually cool stuff. You yeah, know? yeah. It's like, oh my God, this is so wild. He's going to be here any minute. And then he has appeared. Anyway, and just it like, popped like, up on the screen. And he, and he was like, he's like, oh, right, well. And I was like, was he Shit. muted first? Did you have to get, okay, Gary, you're muted. Well, like, I, I, I get anxious in those things. I don't like looking at my face very much, you know. So, like, I was like, is it going to be an audio thing? And they're like, oh, it might be an audio thing, but I think Gary tends to do video. And he has turned on video straight away. And he was in his, like, huge house in LA. He's got a studio in the back. And he's, but he's a geezer. Like, he's like, really cool. And he goes to me, um, he said a few things that are really funny, but one of them he said was they asked him, "Oh, when you when, back in the day when you first started doing um, all the makeup and everything, like you looked out into the crowd and you saw so many people dressed like you, did you um, what did you what do you think? That must have been so weird for you." And this is why I brought this up because of what you said. He said, "He said oh, I just felt bad for them all." He said, he said "What do you, and then we, the, the interviewer was like, what do you mean?" And he said, "Well, the thing is, I have a security guard and the tour bus going to get on, and you're going to get on the uh, on the bus home." <laughs> Dressed like me, you're gonna get your head kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I just felt like you, uh, you poor people. <laughs> the other funny thing he said to me was, um, this is my favorite thing he said. He goes, um, he was talking about all the bad press he used to get back in the day. He was like really humble and like really nice and exactly as you'd want him to be. He goes, um, yeah, there's this one review of my record that said, um, I wish Gary Newman's parents weren't born. So Gary wasn't born and he never made this awful record or whatever. <laughs> and he was laughing about it. And I was like, fucking hell. He said, uh, he said, Will, do you ever get um, any reviews like that? And I said, well, I don't think press really works like that anymore. You don't really get people, like journalists going for people because I think we have to kind of work together because we're both of our industries, print and um, and music, are dying, you know? And yeah. So uh, I don't think it works quite like that. You get maybe get a bad review here and there, but like nothing on that level or, or like that sort of vitriol, you know, like... Uh, um, that really nasty, yeah. snarky shit. Uh, so yeah. I, as I said, the closest I get to it is like, we'll put a song out that'll be like, we made a country song uh, on the last record, uh, like an off, off, off the offbeat thing for us. And um, some, so I'll get some kid going. But I prefer something you did seven years ago. And he laughed, and then he went, "Will, imagine if you wrote Cars." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I haven't done anything about it. <laughs> I don't have to complain about really. That you must get that. asked about that all the time. Like, can you imagine yeah, if you yeah. wrote Cars? Like. Yeah. That's hilarious. He was so nice though. He was, and I, my cat, my cat jumped on me halfway through. Right. And I, and I, my, I have this big white cat called Tofu. He's jumped on my lap, and I was like, "Gary Newman, this is Tofu." And he was like, "He was like, hi, Tofu." Weird. <laughs> it's weird. It's really cool though. That's good. That's great. Um, I'm I'm aware of time. I'm aware of time. Just yes. tell us what what's next for you. What's after this? You know, you're off on tour with Creeper. And this will be out in time for uh, for plugs for that. Oh, cool! So, so I'm on this tour forever. We we finished on Halloween, and so we, and we've been away right. a week already. It's a really long tour for the UK. You know, we tried to make an effort to come to like uh, smaller places that we wouldn't normally come to, especially after the pandemic. And um, so yeah, like we, like we were uh, trying to uh, be out and about as much as we could. So we're playing everywhere. You know. Um, 
So we're doing this with James and Nicole Gunn until uh, Halloween. Uh, we finish in Southampton and I'm going to get really drunk. And then after that, uh, it's the Creeper Tour in December. So I spend the whole of the month of November preparing for that. Then it's the new year and I, all the things that are in place haven't been announced yet because who knows if they need to be pushed back by another year or not. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I, I have a lot coming up. I, just, uh, <clears throat> I can't talk about it uh, at this point because things are subject to change so much at the moment. Do you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the things are getting cancelled and changed and everything. Left so right international center. touring is like, we have a load of that booked in, but yeah. um, I, I'm hesitant to talk about it. Yeah, will you get excited about it or not? Yeah, exactly. That whole, going off subject slightly, that whole Mudvayne reunion thing. Wild. So much hype for that. I know. And then as soon as they were ready to go, it was like, oh, yeah, we can't. We've got COVID in the camp and we've got to reschedule this and that. And it was like, ah, for fuck's sake. I know, I know. Like you guys had this whole momentum and it was like, as soon as you hit that road, it's like, oh, here's the virus. Dude, look at My Chemical Romance. You know, like they came back and then uh, played one show and then couldn't do any of their tours. It sucks. I forgot all about that. That must that will haunt them forever. Yeah, because you can only get that. Imagine all that all that waiting they did, and then they finally get what they want, and then you know they can't even do it. Maybe that'll work in their favor. Maybe now that's only you know whetted the appetite. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. But I was excited to see what kind of shape they'd be when they come back. Not like physically, but just like. Just like, can they still do it? They seemed good at that 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 show, didn't they? I thought they thought they did a really good job at that. Yeah, that would be sick. I was um, meant to interview Frank um, Iero. Oh, once, no way. And um, I got the day wrong. Oh, and uh, I wasn't in the right place or anywhere near any equipment. And it was, I was out somewhere in the rain in a T-shirt. And this guy rang me and he was like, yeah, I'm here with Frank. Um, we're ready for the interview. And I was like, oh, 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 yeah, I thought it was tomorrow. And he was oh, like, no. no, my notes say it's uh, this day. And I was like, oh, well. Oh, so that was oh the, dude, that sucks. That was the one big rock star that got away. Oh man, that you, you'll get him again. I'm sure we'll come get back him later. again when he's got a side project. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You might get Gerard Way. That's that. He's like the golden goose, isn't it? He? he is. Yeah, yeah. You can't see the kid. I feel like I've met Frank before. He's a real nice guy. I only met him one time. Weirdly enough, that same day that the riot fest thing. Right. Uh, I got introduced to him. There. He was real, really, really sweet. But like, no one ever sees Gerard Way. Where is he? Right. What's he doing? Where are you, Gerard? Yeah, <laughs> like, well, like... I was going to touch on this earlier with this whole thing where it's like, you know, sometimes with social media, you can see too much of your heroes or your musicians. I think it's good. I think right. that's good. I think, I think Davey Havoc is a big one for me. He, he was always my hero growing up. And um, I think he's done a really good job of keeping that mystique around him, right. you know? And I think that's the same with Gerard Way. It's like, when he does make an appearance, it means something. You know yeah. what I mean? Right. And like what you were saying with Creeper, when you, you know, I'm not saying too much about what, what you're doing on the road or what I'm doing on the road or whatever, you know, we're going to keep a bit of secret, a bit of mystique. I like that. I, I appreciate that because you can see a backstage video for everything, everywhere. Do you remember when you were a kid? Like, yeah. we talk about this all the time. Like, I remember going to see an Alkaline Trio when I was a kid and um, being like, oh my God, there's somewhere in the building right now before the, you know, before the gig. And that feeling like, Oh my God, like that, how palpable that excitement is. And yeah. going, oh God, I wonder what's going on backstage. Now I know what goes on backstage. Yeah. It's just a bunch of people charging things. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you don't want to see that. You don't want to see people just sat by a plug and, and, or someone sleeping, someone eating a sandwich with some hummus. You don't want to see yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, man. Uh, pleasure. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, now do I get to wear this? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it.